Our scripture today uh, comes from the book of Luke, uh, chapter 10, verse 25 to 37. Um, it's found on page 1612 on your pew Bibles. It says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going up down from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that same road. When he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went, he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for the extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. When I was a wee lad, I really enjoyed learning about history. Uh, the public library near me had this series of books that was about uh, was a biography of every single president, and I read every one of them. Um, I learned a whole lot about the Revolutionary War, and my dad took me to visit all the Civil War battlefields around here. I thought about history all the time, and not many people my age were all that interested in history like I was. Um, uh, so it made me feel special. In elementary school, though, we started to learn about history in third grade. And I remember being kind of annoyed that history was being taught in class, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because now everybody was learning the same kind of history that I had been learning about for a long time. And all of a sudden, the kind of knowledge that I had about history from watching on the History Channel and reading books and visiting battlefields wasn't all that special anymore. I didn't like that other people were learning about history because that meant that I wasn't the only one anymore. I liked feeling special and exclusive. The Jews during the time of Jesus were God's special chosen people. And that was the most important part of their identity. For half a millennium, they were persecuted by one empire after another but they persevered because they knew that they were God's special chosen people, the one hope for the world. And if they served God well, they would be rewarded in this life or the next. Being God's special chosen people was a huge deal for the Jews during this time. Now the lawyer asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And the text says that he was trying to trap Jesus with these words. Now in ancient Judaism, inheriting eternal life was something that only the Jews did. The idea was that if you were a really good Jew and you kept the law and you made sure to keep its commandments even if people resisted you, then you would be raised from the dead in the age to come. But there's no real mention of Gentiles or any non-Jews having that same experience. God has chosen Israel as his special people. And if you embody what it means to be an Israelite, then you will inherit an eternal life and the resurrection at the end of this world. So the answer that the lawyer gives is a good one in this context. How do you inherit an eternal life? You don't only have to be a Jew, you have to act like a Jew. You have to perform the most important commandments that God gave in the Torah so that everyone sees that this is what it looks like to be a Jew. On the other hand, Jesus has been saying some very scandalous things lately. He's been saying things that might lead you to believe that it, it really isn't so much about whether you're born a Jew as much as it's about whether you act like you belong to the people of God. It's about whether you live as if God is really your father, not about whether you belong to a certain ethnic group. 
He talked about how even non-Jewish cities would have repented if God had revealed what, what, he, what, they had, what had been revealed to the Jewish people in this chapter. He said that his family wasn't anybody who was born into the Jewish people, but whoever hears the word of God and does it. For the Jews, that was really scandalous. They understood themselves as God's special chosen family. They felt they would always be God's special chosen family, and nobody else would ever have the relationship that God had with them simply by virtue of their own birth. But Jesus seemed to be saying that there are plenty of people who can have just a special relationship with God, even if they weren't born Jews. In fact, as, he, as we'll see, he was saying that it is the fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament has hoped for. It has always been the purpose of God's people to display God's righteousness to the whole world, to bless it, and eventually for God to allow anyone from any nation to enter into that special relationship that God has with his people. Jesus thought that one of the most important roles of the Messiah is sending the blessings of a relationship with God to all the people. This was not something that a lot of Jews were excited about. If just anybody can join the people of God, then it feels a lot less special, doesn't it? And there is another reason why it was scandalous. That was because, on the other hand, it said you could be a person born as a Jew and not really be a part of the people of God. Of course, that was always the case in the Old Testament. Many people in the Old Testament ignored God and took him for granted, thinking that they would be saved just by their birth. But that was never the case. It was always uncomfortable for it to be pointed out, and Jesus was pointing it out. They didn't like that he was pointing it out. So when the lawyer says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, that's perfectly in line with what Jesus was saying it took to have eternal life. Jesus was saying that if you follow God and do what he says, you are his child, whether you're a Jew or not. So Jesus agrees. Everything he was saying was perfectly in line with the Old Testament and with the Jewish tradition, even if it was inconvenient. But the way that Jesus says it and the way that the lawyer meant it are very different. The lawyer wanted to highlight that Jesus, Jesus believed that even Gentiles could love God and love their neighbor, and even they could get eternal life. The lawyer thinks that Jesus is trying to weasel out of this question, like a politician who's asked a really important and controversial question and then goes up on talking about like freedom and stuff like that. But the lawyer wants Jesus to straight out admit that he wants even Gentiles to experience a relationship with God, and then he thinks everybody's going to leave him. So like a good lawyer, he asks Jesus a question that's meant to trap him in his own words. Yeah, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gives the lawyer far more than he even bargained for. Long story short, the Jews hated the Samaritans more than any other ethnic group. And the Samaritans hated the Jews, too. And it wasn't for nothing. The Samaritans believed that they were God's, they, that they were God's special chosen people, and that the Jews had stolen the title of God's people from them. They thought the whole Old Testament was just Jewish propaganda against the Samaritans. When the time came for the invasions of the Holy Land, the Samaritans always joined in with the invaders against the Jews. And there's still bad blood between the Jews and Samaritans even today. If you look at the map on the screen, um, you'll see that there were three different routes for a Jew to go to Jerusalem in the ancient world from Nazareth. There's a direct one, which was the fastest one, which is the white one in the middle. Um, but no good Jew would ever travel that path because they would have to pass through Samaria and encounter Samaritans. In fact, we know from the context in this gospel that Jesus actually was on this white road that passes right through Samaria. Samaria. He had no problems with doing that. We can read about when Jesus passed through Samaria and was rejected by them in Luke 9, 51 to 55, which is like right before this. But apparently Jesus still bore no ill will toward them anyway. And then there was this one path here in the green. Um, but that was a really dangerous path. And you would never be caught dead on that path during certain times of the year. And then finally, there was this red path. Um, the red path where you would pass through Jericho, go around Samaria entirely, and then finally end up in Nazareth. You'd have to cross the Jordan River twice, and you'd have to go up and down a whole bunch of hills. And you'll notice that in this passage, the person who was hurt was passing on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. 
Like a good Jew, he was making sure to avoid the Samaritans on his way to wherever he was going. So this good Jew is beat up and left for dead, which wasn't terribly uncommon for the, and on this path because there were lots of hills and thieves to, places for heat thieves to hide. Now a priest and a Levite happen to pass by where he's laying, and this is important because a Jewish priest and a Jewish Levite are exactly who this lawyer would have considered a neighbor. They're the most Jewish of all the Jews. They're exactly the kinds of people who would have inherited, inherited eternal life in his mind. But they pass on by. They probably were keeping their distance. They might have thought this guy was dead. And if they got close to a dead body, they would be made unclean. They'd have to wash before the next time they do their duties. It would be a, a big hassle. So they pass on by. But now a Samaritan passed by. Remember, everyone hates the Samaritans. In fact, this guy has been left half dead, is probably taking this route to Jericho specifically to avoid the Samaritans. For the Jews, there is no such thing as a good Samaritan. They are all evil because they all actively hate the Torah and the Old Testament. The Samaritans, just one chapter ago, rejected Jesus and made sure he wouldn't be allowed to stay with them. But this Samaritan goes out of his way to make sure that this guy, who probably hates him, is okay. He not only brings him back to civilization, but makes sure, at his own expense, that he's taken care of and that he survives. Now, the Samaritan didn't even think twice about it. Jesus didn't say anything like, the Samaritan thought, huh, this is my mortal enemy, should I really help him? Or, this is going to be a big hassle, but I guess I'll do it. No, all Jesus focuses on is what the three people did. Not forget about their motiva motivations. He doesn't explain why they did it, because for Jesus, that didn't matter. At the end of the day, you can make whatever excuses you want. All that matters is, did you act like a neighbor or not? Did you take care of the guy who really needed it? Did you fulfill your du duty? Did you act like what God had envisioned Israel to act like in this world? The priest didn't, the Levite didn't, but the Samaritan did, and that's all that matters. Finally, Jesus asks, who acted like a neighbor here? Who acted like they were a part of the kingdom of God? And who took any excuse possible not to do the right thing? And the answer is completely obvious. The Samaritan acted like a neighbor. But the lawyer can't even bring himself to say that. Read what he says in verse 37. It would have been a lot easier and more natural for him to say, the Samaritan acted like a neighbor. But instead he says, the one who showed mercy. He wasn't about ready to give credit to even a fictional Samaritan. But again, even in conceding begrudgingly, he highlights one of the most important parts of this parable again. Through the kingdom of God, this Samaritan is no longer reckoned as a Samaritan, but as the one who showed mercy. mercy. He has been transformed. And now all that matters is what he did, not who he was born to. And the priests and the Levites' identity has nothing to do with anything except that they refuse to show mercy. That's who they are. One of the key things that Jesus is trying to say with this parable is that the law is simple. You shall love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. This lawyer, on the other hand, is really interested in the small minutia on the outsides of the law. He wants to focus on the really complicated stuff and is totally ready to look down on Jesus because he doesn't talk about all kinds of weird, complex stuff in the law. I'm sure this lawyer has spent a ton of time reading and meditating on the Torah. He's respected in the society, and everybody loves him. It's all a credit to him. But there's an incredible danger here that he's missing, and something that I think we can miss too easily, too. For this lawyer, all his studies on the complexities of the Torah has actually made it harder to follow it and not easier. You might see something like this in your own lives. We all know people who like to keep things simple, and they tend to do what they think is right, and they don't get bogged down by all kinds of theory. They do the right thing because they know it's the right thing. They're neighbors. We probably have also seen some people who think that they're really super smart and try to make everything complicated. And then once they feel like they made everything complicated enough that nobody can understand their thought process, they just do whatever they want. This is a far greater danger for people who see themselves as experts than for people who don't. It's a huge temptation for people like this lawyer who know a whole lot about a whole lot of stuff. It's an incredible temptation that many people don't even recognize in themselves, that they can look down on people who don't quite have as, have as much education 
as ignorant and backward, even if they, those people are totally right. These people really do think that everything is complicated, but happens to make it so they can do whatever they want. In a culture that idolizes intellect and expertise, it's really easy to refuse to listen to someone if they don't have the right degree by their, no their, their name. But Jesus said just before this passage, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for that was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except my Father, or who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The lawyer asked, who is my neighbor, trying to get a free pass to not be a neighbor to as many people as he feels like. Jesus simply says, who cares? Just act like a neighbor. The law is simple. Do what it asks you to do. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And God has written that law on our hearts. Look, there's some complicated ethical questions out there, but how many of them do we actually deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? We pretty much know by instinct what the answer is to most of our ethical questions. And the more we follow our instinct that God has given us about the right thing, what the right thing is, the more we'll understand what God's will is. The priest and the Levite probably had all kinds of complicated reasons why they shouldn't take care of their fellow Jew who had needed help on the road. But the Samaritan knew what he was supposed to do and he did it. That's what makes him a neighbor. And Jesus' answer is simple, go and do likewise. Finally, Jesus is continuing to say, to say something that he's been saying this whole time in the book of Luke. Anybody from any nation, any people, or any status can be a part of God's special chosen people if they follow him. The lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? In order to keep Jesus from squirming out of the question like a politician, the lawyer basically says, you're giving this simplistic answer to dodge me here. You've been saying stuff that makes me think that you believe that your kingdom, through your kingdom, the Jews will no longer be God's special chosen people, but instead anybody who follows you will be, from any nation, tribe, or status. So it's best that you own up to it now. And Jesus does own up to it. In fact, even more than the lawyer could have imagined. Jesus is saying, yes, anybody who does the will of my Father in heaven is a part of the special chosen people of God. And yes, that includes people who aren't Jews. In fact, it includes the people that the Jews hate the absolute most. And even more, crucially, it does not include those people who are Jews, high class priests and Levites, that everybody looks up to even if they, if they do not do the will of my Father in heaven. God's kingdom is open to everybody in the whole world. But there's all kinds of boundaries that we tend to put on that. We tend to think it's for the people who dress up nice or act like us or think like us. There are certain people we're comfortable inviting to church, and other people are not so comfortable inviting to church. There's people we're comfortable sitting with and people we're not so comfortable sitting with. But in the church and in the kingdom of God, there is no such distinction. There is no Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. Everyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother and father. And all of this because Jesus has set us free to live in accordance with his will. We could have never done that alone. But instead, Jesus became the ultimate good Samaritan. While we were still in the process of rejecting him, like the injured Jew on the road, we were still, when we were still enemies of Jesus, he sacrificed everything for us to forgive us and set us back on the road. Jesus was despised and rejected by mankind, just like the Samaritan. But instead of hating the world, he loved it and gave himself for it. He bound up our wounds, he forgave our sins, all at his own cost. Who in this story proved to be a neighbor? Jesus did. And even while we hated him, he paid whatever cost was necessary to be our neighbor. And so now, only in the power of God, we have the ability to go and do likewise. When we run across people who hate us, who are in trouble, we make whatever sacrifices are necessary to love them and be their neighbor, because that's what Jesus did for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for loving us even while we were your enemies and even while we hated you. We recognize that that's really difficult for us, but we pray that you would, you would give us strength to do it um, because we know that it's, it's only those who do your will.
that are your people. In your name we pray. Amen.